yeah, definitely really excited to be here today and talk about a topic that is definitely personally important to me, but I'll go ahead and get rolling. Um, so first, just a little bit about me. I'm Alex. Uh, I started working in web development uh, two or three years ago after transitioning from a career in uh, video production. I identify as, as non-binary and, and queer, and uh, I like to not get frustrated filling out forms on the internet, which I think most people could uh, get on board with. And, you know, that is a lot of the reason why that this is um, <clears throat> something of personal importance to me. Uh, I work at Savas Labs. Uh, we're located in downtown Durham. Well, we're re located remotely but for the most part based out of downtown Durham. Um, and uh, we focus a lot on user experience when we're building uh, sites and, and apps and uh, whatever the case may be. User experience is one of the, the biggest focuses in, in what we do. And along with that, we've had a lot of conversations internally about um, you know, what user experience looks like beyond the traditional tenants and just um, base accessibility and, and you know, other ways we can think about that. So as far as what we'll cover, um, I'll just give a quick introduction on the talk, go over um, some terms and, and related terminology, just to make sure everyone's on a level playing field in terms of that. Uh, talk about why does this matter? Why should you be worried about it? Uh, dig a little bit into assumptions we're making about users and, and unconscious bias. Uh, and then finally, um, learning to ask why before how, going beyond the form field and, and thinking about it beyond a user interface perspective. And feel free to drop questions in the Q&A chat as we go. Um, I'll try and answer things as we go. And if I don't see them, then we'll definitely uh, make discussion time at the end. So I want you to think about how many online forms you fill out in a year, um, which is a lot. You know, I think even in a month, we're all filling out a lot of online forms, um, whether it's, you know, a Facebook or Twitter profile, you know, filling out medical history at the doctor's office, surveys, all sorts of things that you're online and <clears throat> providing information about yourself uh, and some of the standard questions, so to speak, that come on those are things like your name, uh, your birthday to get your age, your email, getting a password, and extremely frequently is gender. Um, and these are just two example forms <clears throat> I pulled online. Uh, but gender frequently uh, is one of those standard questions. And I think it's one that most of us don't think about. And I myself had not really thought about at all until a couple of years ago. And so thinking of all those online forms you filled out, <clears throat> have you ever had to select other or prefer not to say as an option in a field or just not had anything to choose? Um, or have you ever had to submit a required field that was information that you just didn't wanna share with whatever it is you were signing up for? Um, I know that's an experience I've had. I know it's an experience a lot of under underrepresented minority groups have had and you know, transgender people specifically, specific to this talk. Um, but it's definitely something that's common and informs throughout. Um, and just as a quick disclaimer, I'm not here to talk about politics or social justice or push any kind of agenda. It's something, like I said, that's that's passionate to me. I'm passionate about just because of my identity, but I, I don't wanna have a political com conversation and rather I'm here to advocate for your users. Um, and users are going, trans and non-binary users are people that are gonna exist within your user base, whether you agree with their identity or not. Um, and in the same way, we all build 
accessible sites for a small percentage of users that are visually or mobility impaired, because we know it's important to create uh, an equal and accessible user experience for them. Uh, my challenge is to be building positive and good user experiences for users across an array of demographics. And everything I'm talking about here is pretty specific to gender, but I think can be applied um, across a lot of different dem demographic groups. Um, but overall, I just wanna advocate for users and, and do the best I can there and you know leave all the nasty politics out of it. Uh, so quick primer on words. Um, Definitely around uh, gender and gender identity, there can be a few terms thrown around that people aren't always familiar with. And one of the big things there is, is differentiating between gender and sex. And a lot of times to explain this, I use uh, the gender bread person, which is a really great tool and resource uh, if you're ever trying to learn more about some of this terminology ter terminology and vocabulary. Um, they're available at genderbread.org. Um, but the purpose basically is to differentiate and make the point that uh, gender identity, uh, your biological sex, your gender expression, and your sexuality are all different things. And none of them are the same, none of them can be lumped in together. And while they certainly combine to create the person you are, they should all be thought about kind of independently. And that's more or less what. Um, <clears throat> the group that makes the gender red person are, are trying to express. Uh, and so, like I said, one of the primary things that tends to come up here is the difference between um, sex and gender. Um, and sex, you know, can be thought about basically as, you know, physiological attributes, uh, genitalia, chromosomes, hormones, um, things like that. Uh, whereas gender identity is more in here. It's a, a psychological sense of self and you know, who you know yourself to be, um, and then gender expression uh, being that outward expression and kind of the way you present yourself to the world. Uh, and the other way the gender red person is interesting is it encourages people to think about these things on a continuum. So it's not uh, necessarily an identity of, I feel like a man or I feel like a woman, but the idea that we can feel both um, and on different levels. So, you know, we, someone who identifies solely as a woman would probably be pretty along that continuum of womanness and either not on that continuum or pretty low of manness. But I like this example because it leaves room for there to be a lot of flexibility in, in how people identify and to give kind of an example of how someone would actually look on this, I tried to like put my identity in, into this scale, which, you know, is not an easy thing to try, to try and do and quantify into three uh, small little sliders. Um, but, you know, the idea being that, you know, as a non-binary person, I pretty much fall in the middle there. And, you know, while I present more masculinely, biologically, <clears throat> uh, I'm more female. Uh, so that's, you know, uh, and I present that mostly just as a case of like, I want you to think about who users like this might be what they look like, case in point. Um, and what's nice, you know, everyone's gonna be a little bit different on that and, and have different preferences as far as names and pronouns and, and things like that. Uh, as far as some other quick definitions, uh, you might hear the, the term cisgender a lot, uh, which simply means that uh, your gender lines up with the <clears throat> sex you were assigned at birth. And when I say si assigned at birth, it's, you know, the doctor's there and says, aha, it's a boy, and puts male on the birth certificate. That would be your birth assigned sex. Um, so if you were born male and identify as a man, you would be cisgender, generally speaking. Um, and transgender is just exactly the opposite of that. It's someone whose gender identity is different 
than the sex that they were assigned at birth. Uh -uh. And then non-binary uh, is basically an umbrella term for folks who don't identify exclusively as male or exclusively as female and fall somewhere in the middle there. And sometimes that might look like someone choosing to be androgynous. Sometimes that might look like someone skewing slightly masculine in the center or feminine in the center or switching back and forth. Um, and there are a lot of identities that fall under there. I listed a few there at the bottom as much as I would like to be able to ex explain all the nuance there. There certainly isn't time for that in this presentation. Um, but the, the point being that non-binary is, is this in-between kind of gray area uh, to think of and, and folks who aren't identifying one way or the other on that gender binary, so to speak. So why does this matter? Um, and to talk about why this matters, it, for me, it's pretty simple, but I like to go back and think about what user experience and UX design is all about. Um, and I kind of pulled some uh, quotes from my coworkers as well as uh, cruising through the internet um, and some thoughts of, you know, what is UX design all about? And obviously this is something that everyone will define a little differently and see a little bit differently, but you know, some of the things I pulled out are creating things for the people, uh, solving problems with empathy and re removing obstacles and friction from your user's path, um, creating positive emotions, establishing trust, making accessible interfaces. All of this is something that can go into to UX design and, and some of the goals in that and pay attention to the bolded words because those will carry us a little bit into the next slide. Um, and I have a couple of quotes on the next slide that are from uh, a company called League has a really great post on Medium uh, about creating inclusive gender inputs. And as part of that, they did some user testing and surveys. And so a couple of these quotes are what they included within that blog. Um, so one of them is, I feel like I'm a person that doesn't get reflected in forms, it's invalidating. Um, it's possible folks will identify with one of the options on a forum. When they don't, it can be a hurtful reminder that their journey is not reflected. And for me, the entire answer of why does this matter lies here. And that if we're talking about user experience and UX design, we're talking about building experiences and interfaces for the people using them. You know, we wanna get those positive emotions. We want it to be accessible. We want our users to trust us and have empathy when using them. And when you juxtapose those with words like invalidating and hurtful and, you know, having someone's journey not being reflected in the world, to me, that's the whole answer is simply that if a user has come to my site or tried to use a tool I've created and they feel invalidated by it, then they're probably not gonna use that tool. They're certainly not gonna recommend it to somebody else. And I haven't left them with a very good experience regardless of how good that tool might be. Um, so next I'll dig in a little bit on some of the assumptions we make about our users. And I know uh, we can talk uncon unconscious bias to death in this field a little bit, but I do wanna to touch on it um, because it's certainly important to this and, and um, all of our work. Um, and really what I wanna say is everyone battles unconscious bias. Uh, you could be the most woke person in the world and still this kind of stuff works itself in. Um, and the reason why is because everything we do is informed by our own life experience. Um, you know, when I'm building out an interface, the first person that I'm testing that on is me. 
um, or occasionally, you know, a coworker being like, hey, I'm trying to do this. Do you think this works? And obviously, of course, we're going through a lot more tests and <clears throat> QA specifically around uh, accessibility and usability. But as we're building tools, the reality is we're, we're the first person we're testing. Um, and all we have there is our own life experience. And so with an idea of unconscious bias and how that can show up in work, um, this happened, I guess a month or so ago, someone uh, did a little experiment um, and uploaded both these photos on the right to Twitter to see where the Twitter algorithm would fix, would choose as the focus point. Um, and obviously in the case of this tweet, it shows uh, Mitch McConnell McConnell in both cases. Um, and a lot of people ended up doing a lot of variations on this um, where they changed tie colors or using different people in images, uh, using different dress and uh, every variation, it seemed to be kind of this consistent theme of this algorithm choosing to, to show white people over um, black people or people of color. Um, and, you know, I actually really enjoyed, enjoyed might not be the right word, but reading some of the Twitter developers response to this and, you know, simply saying that, wow, you know, this is something that we were actively trying to work against. Um, you know, we ran this through some, some bias testing to make sure that this wasn't the case, but obviously we missed something. We're going to take a look at it again which to me is a perfect example of this wasn't intentional. This is something they were actively working to combat and it still happened, which again is just simply that's your own user experience working, your own experience in the world working its way into an actual user's experience. Um, this is another similar case, uh, you know, a photo upload doesn't meet criteria because the subject's eyes are closed. Um, Obviously the person's eyes are open, but if an algorithm is used to, uh, isn't used to seeing that kind of image uh, or that kind of <clears throat> look, then obviously that algorithm's not gonna know to recognize that. Um, and again, this is something that is unintentional, um, unintentional and just kind of result of the way it is. And the only reason I bring these up is simply to say, it's okay to like make mistakes where we all are not gonna be perfect every single time. And the best we can do is be aware of it. Uh, and quite simply the best way to, to realize how to fix these problems is to realize that you do make assumptions about users. I make assumptions about users all the time. Um, I usually make assumptions that they will be more intuitive than they are. Um, but it's something all of us uh, do as developers. And I'm actually gonna skip over the next slide. Um, and with all that, it just boils down to, we don't know what we don't know. So I think many of you, like me growing up, probably grew up with the idea that there are two genders, male and female. That's it. Um, that's what I knew to be true until three or four years ago. Um, so personally, you know, if I was creating a form, it would never occur to me to give any option other than male or female. Uh, and I know that's the case for a lot of people now is you don't know what you don't know. And if you've never thought about there being a third or fourth or different option on gender fields, then that's okay. It's not a criticism. It's, it's simply a way to learn and become more informed and try and find ways that you can create these user experiences and kind of um, put aside that assumption that you've carried um, for however many years. Um, so with a lot of that context uh, and definition kind of things, <clears throat> we have 
I'll dig into asking why before how. And what I mean here is the question of how do we make this gender field as inclusive as possible, which is a great question to ask and one that I love to see people ask. Um, but before we get there, we need to start with why do we need to ask for this at all? And again, this talk is specific to gender, but this, <clears throat> you know, can be anything. Why do we need to ask for users' race? Why do we need to ask for their age? Why are we asking for this data from our user and how are we gonna use it? Um, and more importantly, how is that information going to create a better experience for the user? If they offer that information to us, we need to be using it uh, in an effective way. Um, so a lot of things that come up uh, specifically to, to gender in this regard is demographics. Um, so obviously a lot of all of us, I think, get demographics on who is using our, our site, who's using our tool. Um, and the question to dig in there is why is gender specifically important in that demographic data? So let's say you pull data and you find out that 75% of your users identify as male. Okay, that's great. What are you gonna do with that information? Is it, well, since most of our users are male, we need to appeal to them more by having a more masculine design. Maybe, but at that point, what about your other 25% of users that aren't male? Are you going to choose to do something that might off-put them to appeal to that larger demographic? Um, is that really the most effective thing to be basing designs off of? And that's just kind of an off the cut cuff, um, example. <clears throat> but simply put, how are you using that data? Are you using it in an effective way? And if you're not, challenge why you're asking for it. Jonathan, I see you said here that there's a parallel here with responsible data collection. Um, if you're going to plan some, send someone a coupon during their birthday night, the month, the only detail to collect is month, not the full birth date. Um, and to be intentional and inclusive when collecting information, and you're ac absolutely right. Um, all of that plays in here is stopping and asking. Why are we asking for this data? How are we using it? And like I said, you know, it's a perfect example, Jonathan, that this applies way beyond gender. Um, and obviously it's just my specific focus. Um, another example uh, is legal and medical records. Um, so yeah, you know, let's say you're filling out medical records for your, your doctor's office online. Um, obviously, you're really concerned about security and privacy in that case. Um, and that's a perfect example of perhaps you should be asking for sex instead of gender, um, because more than likely that's the information you need. And if a person's sex is the information you need, then that's the information you ask for, um, which kind of leads to the the last question there is, if you're using that gender field to deduce something, if you're trying to figure out pronouns, don't just try and figure it out based off one field. Ask specifically for the information you need, and more importantly, tell the user why you're asking for it. Um, and as a personal aside, uh, you can tell the user why you're asking for it, but it also really helps if it's a compelling reason. I know recently I was going through a signup form with a, a streaming service and gender was a required field and it had the little, <clears throat> uh, I could hover and see, why are we asking for this information? It's like, well, we're, we're asking to give you a more personalized um, set of recommendations on what to watch, which to me was just not a good enough reason because for me, I don't know how they can possibly construe what I want to watch based off of my gender. So it's thinking about why you need that information and also making that a compelling case uh, to your user. And 
like I said, this is a conversation that we have a lot on our team and actually led us to make a tool around this um, called Should I Ask for Gender, which is just simply as shouldiaskforgender.com. Uh, and the idea there is <clears throat> folks can go through a quiz, uh, it'll take you to an answer that said, no, you should avoid asking for gender and here's why. Or yes, you have a great use case or maybe, but here are some things to consider. And along with that, providing some resources uh, and a glossary of terms to, to help people understand things more. And you know, one of the goals we had in creating this was uh, simply to create a more accessible and easy or easy as can be tool uh, that folks can share with other people. So the day after we launched this, uh, I had a friend text me and say, hey, I'm working on this site with a client. Um, and I think it was like a high school or something it's, and their interest form uh, has gender on it. What, what should that look like? Do you think we even need that there? And I was like, oh my gosh, your timing is perfect. Let me send you this website um, because it has some of the resources that'll be helpful that you can then you know share with your client, um, which was awesome. And thanks guys for that feedback. Um, definitely excited about creating that tool um, and hopefully making it a little bit easier for people to ask that question and, and help other people think about it. Uh, and the last section here is thinking beyond the form field in terms of user experience. So again, I think the very well-intentioned good question people ask is how do I create this inclusive form field that's great and that's good, but user experience extends far beyond that form field. Um, and to illustrate this, I just want you to think about user story as users realize a new gender identity and they're going through the process and they've changed their name, um, obviously using a different gender. Uh, they've changed their email to align with the new name they've had for themselves and simply, are you equipped to handle that? And you would think that most people would say, yes, that seems like a very obvious thing that should be able to be handled, but you would be surprised at how difficult <laughs> this is in some places. So some questions to think of here to reduce the friction uh, for users going through this is, can users update their data? Are you giving them edit access on their own data. So, you know, I've run into a name field not being editable more times than I think I could even count at this, at this point. Um, and sometimes depending if it, depending on the service, it, it might require a phone call, which I'm a millennial. I don't like phone calls. If I can't do it online, I get, I get really grouchy, um, but you know, sometimes it happens. But that is all part of the user experience, is if I'm going through your site and trying to find a way to change my name and I realize I'm going to have to call you and figure it out, I'm not feeling great. I'm feeling a little bit grumpy um, versus just being able to <clears throat> change it there with an online form in the same place that I created the profile. Uh, another thing to think about in reducing that friction is this is a repeated action. So we talked about how many form fields you grow up, you fill out in a year. <clears throat> Think about how many profiles you have that exist and you have to change your name and your email on all of them, all with different processes. So my challenge is always to strive to be the pleasant surprise uh, throughout that process. So, you know, while users are slogging through and on the phone and sending off emails, whatever the case may be, be the one that makes it really easy. And you can stop and smile and be like, oh, thank you for this. Thank you for this gift of my time because we don't want our users to be stuck and encountering friction and not being able to get through things. Um, and with that is 
challenging the process and affecting change at higher levels. So a lot of times a phone call is required is because they need to run it through some other department or someone specifically has to make that change. As people building the sites, as people building or advocating for a product, I always advocate that we take on that burden. The burden should be on us there, not on our users. Um, you know, giving the users a simple form that says, give us all this information. Here's how it's gonna go. We'll let you know what happens. <laughs> the terrible voice wrecking. Yeah, yes, nothing worse than calling customer service. Agree with you, you all in the chat for sure. Uh, and finally, in terms of reducing friction is propagation. So when I hit save on that form, I assume that that change is gonna be visible everywhere across that site and especially in the page that I'm on. And surprisingly, that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, Kathleen, you said, one of the designers avoid asking for gender. How do you make sure you don't fall into, there are no women on the internet issue. I tend to find gender isn't directly specified on mine. And people default to assuming everyone is male. Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> And I think that's a good question. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, when you look at unisex t-shirts, unisex t-shirts are male t-shirts. Um, a lot of things default to male on the internet. And I think, you know, one of the easiest ways to figure out if you are is having women and females involved in the process, which obviously speaks to one of the issues we have in this industry is, is diversity and having people in the room that can, <clears throat> that can understand and point out uh, where some things might, you know, be defaulting to a male perspective. Um, and I guess, you know, the other thing that I would always challenge people to is if you are using that demographic data in a specific way and notice that 75% of my users are male and only 25% are female, perhaps the data usage there isn't in how can I serve the majority of my audience, it's asking how can I serve this minority and get more people that don't identify as male to, to use my product or site or service. Uh, legal name changes um, are kind of a different animal. And I don't think in most case uh, would be something that we would be handling in, in open source projects, but uh, banks in particular, uh, medical services, mostly banks, it feels like have legal name changes. But if that is ever something you run into, universities for sure, um, if someone's changed their name legally, they have documentation. Um, they already have it. Like that's just what happens when you change your name legally. Um, <clears throat> so the user is always gonna be able to verify that legal name change and you just need to give them an avenue to be able to do that. Um, and of course, going back to asking why, do you need a legal name? If you just need to know what to call them, ask for your name, ask for their name. Uh, and then always keep in mind that a lot of times people ask for a preferred name. And I know a lot of folks uh, get really put off by that. And the idea that name's not a preference, it's, it's just their name. Um, so I see a lot of ways people get around this is simply asking, what do we call you? or what name do you go by, or something similar to that. And having that be your primary source for the name versus you know, the legal one and only using that legal information where it needs to be changed. So a good example of a user-friendly process in this regard uh, is PayPal, where next to your name, they have a little thing that says, do you need to change your name? Uh, and you can choose between uh, updating, you know, a nickname, making a minor correction, or changing your legal name. And then change your legal name. <clears throat> they say, upload your ID, upload your documentation. 
and we'll handle it. And that's exactly the kind of user experience I think we need to strive for is I'm sure PayPal has to do something on their back end to push that through and make it all official. But the point is that they're taking that burden and not putting it on the user. And furthermore, they're even giving you an option to upload it from your phone too. <clears throat> uh, frustrating processes from my own personal experience. And I think if you're in this chat, these are probably not things that <laughs> you're um, encountering or have to run into, but simply uh, one credit card company I was trying to change my name with, I literally could not do it. I felt terrible for the person I was talking to on the phone because she was trying so, so hard and realized that she just like did not have the power to change my first name. And so ultimately I had to send them a letter via snail mail saying what I needed which as far as user experience goes, is pretty <laughs> horrifying if I have to drop something in the mail and wait uh, a full week or whatever it is. And you know, if you contrast that with a different credit card company where I send a secure message and they're like, okay, great. Um, another one was a utility company, their online portal. Uh, I had to go get a form notarized, verifying that my certified court order of a name change was a certified court order. I've never figured that one out. Again, as far as user experience goes, if I have to go to a bank and send you a form, then I'm frustrated. Um, and then there's one account where it's just impossible for me to change my name, period. Still haven't done it. <laughs> um, so it's things like those that if you're asking for these things, if this is a consideration you're making is, you know, when I say beyond the form field, this is the stuff that I mean, is that it's not just, I've asked you for your gender in a responsible way, but that I've created a really positive user experience for you throughout my entire site and beyond the site and just with, you know, our organization as a whole. So, for the summary, the too long, didn't read version, have a compelling reason to ask for gender, explain to the user why you're asking for it, give users the control to change their information, put that process in place, reduce the friction as much as possible, check on your assumptions. Uh, you know, even if you can't relate to a person's life experience, do what you can to understand and, and empathize with them and figure out what you can do to make them have a good experience with with your your product and last you know these trans and non gender non-conforming folks exist they're using tools they're using products every day um and their experience matters just as much as the next person so that is what I've got. And obviously already some discussion in the chat there and definitely happy to open it up to, to more questions with the last few minutes we have here. Thank you, Maria. Jonathan, yes. Uh, names are not a preference. Preferred pronouns is definitely another pet peeve that comes up. Thank you so much, Lucia. Uh, definitely agreed there, Gail. Um, <clears throat> I'm really fortunate to work for a place that is focused so much on inclusivity and hopefully it's something that uh, <laughs> we can keep bringing to people in the future. 
Um, let's see, uh, do you have any resources for new devs to learn more? Somebody asked and I do, let me pull up a couple options. So I mentioned that, um, that uh, Medium article that had some of the user stories there, I'll paste that in. Uh, I think this is a really good resource. I um, also saw a mention on the genderbred person. Uh, paste that in. And actually, I think my best collection of resources in regards to this is on that Should I Ask for Gender website. I'll also paste in. Uh, and the resources here really go through, you know, a lot of things that are specific to, um, whoops, to development. Um, some are simply like glossary terms, transgender, lots of different things, but that's kind of my best set of resources. India, yeah, checking accounts, uh, looking into processes for updating personal information. It's a, it's a wild ride. <laughs> uh, let's see, with the number of options for gender and pronouns, it feels like a free text input is the best way to let people provide their information. Are there some best practices for recon reconciling information in aggregate? Um, other concern is users who misuse those fields. Yeah, and this is what's really challenging is with that many gender identities, it, it is incredibly difficult to have a free text field um, in large part because the data storage is so challenging. And actually this um, principles for inclusive gender inputs, I really like the process they go through here. Um, and actually creating fields kind of like this one uh, that are multi-select field um, where you have the option of adding one uh, that might not be there. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that I've struggled a little bit with the free text fields. I'll have to, I feel like I at some point had something uh, had read something pretty concrete um, outside of that on, on ways to handle it. But there are uh, some resources out there that'll give you a list of, of possible fields to, to fill a select box. But yeah, I think the best we can do in terms of combating against people who are providing hurtful or, or mocking kind of information is, um, you know, filtering out some words, you know, words that we know to be derogatory, which is a huge pain on the developer side. Um, or, yeah, you know, I, part, part of the problem is aggregating it is just uh, tough uh, from that developer perspective. And actually, I do remember the resource that was good there, which is, And this article, when binary code won't accommodate non-binary people, is actually what got me started down that path. So that might be a good read. <clears throat> Gonna be very predictive. Uh, yeah, multiple choice options, male, female, other. Um, I think for me, gender fields should always be optional. I think that is 100% of the time and kind of one of the most important things you can do. Um, and I think there's a case for obviously male, female. Um, if it is a required field, at least having the option of prefer not to answer. Um, I like to avoid the word other because 
um, nobody wants to like be considered an other. So another thing I've seen people do a lot is, uh, you know, male, female, and then having a radio option for self-identify. And if you select that option, um, a text field can appear that they can put in their own custom input. So that's another option as well. Thank you for having you here. We really enjoyed the session, Mr. Alex, and there was a lot to learn and really appreciate it. Absolutely, it was a pleasure. I always like um, sharing the good word and, and talking about it, especially with some like-minded folks, which it looks like we have.